So yeah, thank you for the introduction. Thanks for having me here. Um, welcome to my talk. I'm Alexander Kulik. I'm working with the BR Systems Group at Boston University of Weimar on multi-user virtual reality, and we're more on the user interface side than on the content side because we consider them to be ideal user interfaces to enable collaborative or cooperative action. So I'd like to, talk, uh, to start this talk with a, a very trivial insight that we are social beings. And apparently we also organize our social behavior in space. So that's relevant for VR. Um, like Edward T. Hall found out that, we, that there are distances are relevant from social space, of course, or from, from intimate space ranging to public space that we have here. And the most important part for us is uh, the social and the personal space where most um, collaborative uh, interaction in professional sense takes place. However, most current user interface are personal, private, and the current hype of VR are rather pushing towards the intimate. Um, and we don't consider that to be the most um, ideal way to go. But we rather think um, that user interfaces should at some point become social in the sense that we perceive ourselves and others in the same place, with the same data, with the same content, and that we cannot only look at the same content, but that we can um, interact simultaneously in that virtual environment. And um, that's apparently a challenge, actually, because uh, software architectures are not meant to, um, to, to enable uh, multiple events taking place at the same time. So this is just a short video showing how our systems work. Um, we have this large-scale large uh, multi-user 3D display here, and uh, three users here in that case, uh, exploring a virtual castle. And since they are part of that space, they can communicate in that space with their direct pointing gestures. And we develop then tools to interact with the environment, because true, we cannot touch it, but we can extract parts of the environment, choose to enter these images using portals as a portal. So that's the metaphor behind that. But what you see here, and that's what, I, what we consider to be very important, um, you experience that these environments together. So you can exchange about what you see, you can discuss what you see, so it becomes more relevant somehow. So our systems support joint perception of shared 3D environments. And joint perception apparently is different to single user perception or to, to individual perception because there is a social dynamics attached to it. So for example, we know from psychology that co-experience stimuli are more salient or rather things that we believe our peers are also looking at are more salient to us. Um, in the same way, the focus of attention is shifted. So <clears throat> we, it's more easier, for example, to keep on a particular topic where we know others are also working on that and we exchange about it. Um, another interesting um, insight is also that even if we distribute workload, if we say like, okay, you look for uh, blonde people in the streets, I look for black haired people in the streets, um, I will still represent the task of the others. So um, we represent uh, distributed tasks uh, holistically. And what we also found is, um, and it's obvious actually, Collaborative visual search, um, which is more uh, in, 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 um, um, in an application setting, might be relevant. It's actually also significantly more effective. So, if you um, if we would employ virtual reality in medicine, for example, having doctors um, analyze uh, CT scans, so that can be useful because they search for something and they can do that more effectively together. The most important part, the most important observation for us regarding virtual reality is actually something else, that you confirm the appearance, the perception, the experience of that virtual environment. At the very moment that somebody else is pointing to something, to the simulated environment that I'm seeing, to features I'm seeing there, it becomes more relevant and also more believable. Um, so it's, it's not anymore something that is decoupled from me and, uh, and my environment, but it's something that we experience together and therefore it must be real. Um, but how do we achieve it? The first step is uh, to build a multi-user 3D display. And if you consider uh, something as illustrated here, um, those six persons standing in front of the screen might, might be engineers being interested in the design of a new autobus. 
and they should uh, certainly see the, um, the geometry in the same place in that virtual environment. But that requires that from the left, the car, of course, looks like that. From the center perspective, you see only the front, and from the rightmost perspective, you see that. So for six people, we need to present 12 different images to uh, provide them with stereo perspectives. Um, we do that, and then we separate these images again using custom shutter glasses. Also, the projectors so far are custom, and therefore, I mean, the image quality is, was, wasn't ideal so far. Um, but I can tell you that it, it's becoming a commodity product. Not very cheap, so, at, a, at the beginning, but it's becoming a commodity product, and we just have installed the first um, commercial set of projectors doing this trick at 4K resolution, and that's really, really nice. So, we can achieve joint perception in shared 3D environments, but we also want to get things done. So how do we support um, joint action? And if we look at the real world, we employ our whole bodies um, in that interaction. And you could argue, well, yes, uh, virtual reality is different. We don't have weight. So we do, might not need our whole bodies, at least not the strength of our bodies. But we can take advantage of the flexibility that we have in all these degrees of freedom of our body. And we can also take advantage of the expressiveness of our bodily actions and of our body, scan, uh, of our body skills. So we were looking at the psychology of joint action and just summarizing a few results from, um, <coughs> from a review of Knoblich and colleagues um, who separates the coordination efforts into planned coordination, which is a top-down process, and emergent coordination, which are bottom-up processes. So the top-down processes are joint perception, <clears throat> what I've already been talking about, but additionally it means that um, we need to develop empathy, so we need to have an idea what the other sees, and that again requires to live in the same, um, in the same environment. And also, of course, we need to achieve alignment in the task that we are going to do. <clears throat> what I find even more interesting are the emergent coordination processes, which, um, for example, is joint affordance. The affordance of objects and environments is different for a group than for a single person. A door, for example, if it's open, it affords going through for one person, but it affords negotiating who goes through for a group of people. Um, perception action matching is very, very interesting. So if we see somebody doing something, acting, the involved limbs, our involved limbs, only by the observation become activated. So if we see somebody kicking a ball, our limbs will be activated for action or prepared for action. Uh, in the same <coughs> direction goes action simulation. That's certainly the way how we learn most things, by simply copying them. But later on, we, the same process are still in, in, in place. We don't copy the same action anymore, but we simulate what others are doing, and that's relevant to be able to, um, to react to changing situations. And what I find most interesting is actually entrainment. That means when we are doing things cooperatively, just maybe two hands acting in cooperation and coordination, they need to be in sync. For the example of juggling, it's obvious, but we can achieve the same thing juggling together. It requires a quite a bit of training. It requires entrainment um, because we, you need to develop a, <coughs> a very strong awareness of each other. But apparently we, um, we have an inherent ability to achieve that. The psychologists have um, observed people in rocking chairs on a porch. Even so, the rocking chairs have different eigenfrequencies. At some point, people start rocking at the same rhythms. And that's funny. So we have a tendency to fall into sync. So it's an inherent social capability. And such spatial temporal coordination is a key. As you can see in that example, it's a mundane situation, right? You are at a conference. The waiter is coming with tablets of, um, of wine or whatever, water, and you grab one of these glasses. If he would only react to a changed situation, that would be too late. You must react to the changed weight distribution right at the same moment it occurs. So, he, so therefore, he needs all that action simulation um, and, uh, and training. So we must interact and swing somehow. But how do we achieve such mutual awareness? Um, 
Goodwin and Greenberg have been exploring that in real world setting very early in 2002 already and they tried to define it, so the most important aspects of what they call workspace awareness as the up to the moment understanding of another person's interaction with a shared workspace. And they tried to find ways to achieve that in virtual settings. But they also, uh, but they also ident uh, found out that in um, real world settings, through the coherence of the interaction in, in a space where you interact, um, such mutual awareness is uh, conveyed um, implicitly through consequential communication, which is the postures and movements of our bodies while we are performing certain activities, which we simply perceive, um, feed through, which is the noises and dynamic appearances of tools we are using, and intentional communication, of course, pointing and telling that occurs. So um, another um, observation that I find particularly important for supporting multiple users to do work together is territoriality. Scott and colleagues observed that people working together on a table with tangible things, with pen and paper, they establish implicitly different territories for group inter exchange, for private interaction, and for storage. And without even talking about it, we accept there are different, that different rules apply in these different territories. Of course, this is a dynamic process, but we must provide the space and the ability to separate spaces for private interaction also to achieve the possibility to, um, to transition frequently between closely and um, loosely coupled collabor collaboration. Um, and the third thing that I found uh, to be, find to be very important is complementarity. So when we work together, it's not very useful if we do the same thing all the time, but rather we should support each other with different skills and capabilities. Um, and in the real world, um, the tools that we use can be all combined together, right? Because they are, um, their interface is physics. So we can just take a ruler and combine it with a pen to draw a straight line. In virtual reality, drawing a straight line is easier. Yeah, that is, that's for a given, but still combining um, combining tools is something that is uh, very beneficial if you can achieve um, um, more uh, expressiveness with that. And uh, Benford found, for example, that that can be also found ways how that can be achieved um, in virtual reality, but every interaction must be programmed. So, to summarize, these are our design principles, if you want, so for user interfaces that support cooperation. We need that workspace coherence, we need to support emergent territoriality, and we should provide or offer tools that, are that have complementary capabilities that can be combined to um, achieve more powerful functionality. And I'd like to shortly dive a bit deeper into the workspace coherence because we have been working on all these topics, but in workspace coherence we have been also working on the inclusion of people who are not locally pr present. Um, so in distributed settings. Um, here's a short video showing how that works. So the two guys in the, um, in the white, um, in, in white are, <coughs> are locally present, are looking at our multi-user screen. The two persons in the back, they are at, on another screen at a, <coughs> at a different place in our lab. And they are captured in real time in 3D and reconstructed in that environment. So we still share the same uh, the, the, the same virtual space and therefore we are able to see where people look, to, at whom they are looking, what they are pointing to and so on. So we can directly communicate as we are used from the real world. Um, so shutter glasses are still a problem obviously, we cannot establish eye contact, um, but in the future we, we'll, we'll, we foresee that um, light field displays will change that. <clears throat> but the avatars still look crude. This is just a short video showing how our avatars look now. This is Stefan Beck, my colleague, who is uh, working on this topic. Um, so that's the quality that we currently achieve in real time um, and 3D. So um, with, with that, um, we believe that we can now go towards uh, the <clears throat> development of distributed social user interfaces that what we're currently interested in. And since the time is over, I guess I just suggest to look at our group's website if you're interested in our work towards the other uh, parts of our design principles. Thank you very much.